Heather McDonald has got the juices scoop. When you're on the road, when you're on the go, Juicy Scoop is the show to know. She talks Hollywood tales, her real life Mr. Segment, serial data, and serial sister. You'll be addicted and addicted fast to the number one tabloid real life podcast. Listen in, listen up. Woo woo. Heather McDonald. Juicy Scoop. Well, I wanted to give you guys a treat during this summertime fun, and that is one of my favorite interviews that I did, and that is with comedian Miss Pat. I got such a great response from it. It was so hilarious, but also so incredibly heartfelt, and her life story is just fascinating. So let's revisit it now with the hilarious Miss Pat. This episode of Juicy Scoop is brought to you by Booking.com, Booking.Yeah. Guys, it's finally time for summer travel, and I could not be happier. Booking.com offers so many possibilities across the U.S. for all the travelers you want to be, which is perfect for me. I'm doing a lot of traveling, some for work, some for fun, and some a combo. You guys know I have Dallas, Houston, and Austin coming up. I'm bringing Chris Frangiola and you know I'll be doing it through Booking.com. This summer, you can book whoever you want to be on Booking.com. Booking.yeah, book today on the site or app. This episode of Juicy Scoop is sponsored by Away. You guys have seen their fabulous suitcases for years in the airport. Softside comes in four of their best-selling sizes and tried in true colors. So there's something for everyone in the lineup. Two carry-on sizes, two check sizes. The colors are black, blue, pink, and gray. They are made from high-strength nylon, so the bag is tear-resistant as well as weather-resistant. The bag is soft but not sensitive. It's super durable, flexible, and expandable. You've got to check out the new soft side luggage from Away. Head over to awaytravel.com slash juicy scoop. That's awaytravel.com slash juicy scoop to see the new soft side luggage from Away. Awaytravel.com slash juicy scoop. Very excited to have comedian podcaster, host of many shows, your own TV shows, Ms. Pat. Welcome. I am so excited for my audience to get to know you better today. Well, thank you for having me. I was excited when uh, I got a call. He's like, you're going to do Heather. I was like, okay, I tried many times to get here. No, you haven't. Well, yes, we have. My schedule just wouldn't let us. Oh, okay. So when, when okay, I because I def- I'm saying definitely yeah. no, but nobody's been like... Would you like her? And I said, no. So I'm glad that it worked out I because I like to have people in person. So well, Pam have pitched me many times, and but it never lines up. Okay. But it did this time. Good, good. So I want – you have a very interesting background of how your life and your kids and – so let's just get let everyone know how you got to have such a funny point of view on your life because I think your point of view is very unique. Well, if you're not familiar with me, um, I always like to start from the beginning. I had two kids by a married man by the time I was 15. Dropped out of school. Wait, you're married? Grade. Wait, you had two kids by the time you were 15? Yeah, by a married man. I wasn't married. I wasn't oh, married. Oh, how where, How did you meet him? Uh, at the skating ring. <laughs> roller skating. God, I loved roller skating. <laughs> so and did so he. he. So wait a minute. So you're in high school. No, I'm not in high school. Uh, at that time, school. yeah, you had to be in high school. No. I was, it was, I'm 51, so it was no high, was no middle school, so you, you went from elementary straight to high school back in oh, those okay. days in some area. So okay. So I, I was in elementary school. You were still like up to the eighth grade or whatever, ninth yeah, grade. Yeah, it, it went to the eighth grade. Okay, and so you're there roller skating around. I went to a, a kid's night, like a little teen night, and yeah. he was there. And how old was he? 22, married with a baby on the way. And so he starts flirting with you. Uh, no, we just he started coming by the next day and and we kind of got to know each other. And, you know, I'm this little girl, oh, boyfriend, which is with somebody whole husband. And I end up getting pregnant and uh, I had to end up having two kids dropped out of school. in the eighth Did grade. the woman know about you? Yeah, she knocked on my door and told me I was pr- uh, pregnant by her husband. Which now, what city me. were you growing up in? I grew up in Atlanta. So what did your mom say? Uh, nothing. <laughs> my mom was an alcoholic. I mean, oh. pretty much I raised myself. Mm-hmm. So, um, you know, she, one thing I know about life, um, uh, curses are passed down. What happened to my mom, she allowed to happen to me. 
But when it got to me, I stopped it from happening to my daughter. So generation curses are true. I used to always I used to tell this bit, uh, if 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 your if your mom got welfare, then the child is gonna get welfare. The only reason why my daughter don't get welfare is because she's gay and she have no kids. <laughs> So the curse was stopped right there when my daughter decided to eat what she was born with. So there was no need for her to go on, on the system. When did she come out? My daughter? Yeah. Gay? Oh, child, I knew my daughter was gay from ever, from the beginning. You know, yeah. you be in denial, but, you know, my daughter been licking plates the wrong way since she was a baby. <laughs> <laughs> If your child is gay and you fucking, excuse me, I don't know yeah. if I'm cursed, but if you look at other curse. way, this is very... you are a damn fool. D now, today, kids come out your vagina with a fucking gay flag in their hand. Right. Back then, the flag would fold up nice and neat. But my <laughs> daughter was gay from from day one. I, I, there was no doubt she was gay. You can look the other way, but you you know yeah you know when you, I mean it's the same way when you tell you if your child is, is sick or if your child is not feeling well it's the same thing so yeah. you know when your child is not acting a certain way and as she got older, um, and as she got older and she was stuck in that closet. You know, she started to get meaner. She didn't like me because I didn't like gay women. So it was just so many clues there. But yeah. I'm fine with her now. I mean, she go through women like we go through lipstick. She's a player. Uh, she's a whore. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> she's a hoe. <laughs> I told her, I'm glad you gay, because you probably will have a lot of kids. <laughs> oh, my gosh. You're so... Okay, so so this girl, so the guy is coming around, and, and you have the one baby with him. And then I have another baby one. I had a baby at 14, and I had another baby at 15. Both by him? Yeah, both by him. And was the wife nasty to you? I mean, did she want to, like, hurt uh, you for coming well, out? she was mad, man? but when she showed up and realized I was a damn kid, it because she was, she probably was 19. Uh-huh. And I was uh 14. Wow. So, for you to show up and, you know, and you see your husband having an affair with a 14-year-old, what do you do? I mean, my whole thing is I thought I was in love, and I wasn't going anywhere. Because I just thought, you know, he said the right thing to me, which is, I love you. So I wasn't willing to let go. So eventually, she, I ran her off, and I thought I was going to be number one child. Bitches start falling out the sky like rain. Well, like, I can't even imagine. So you're this little kid, like, having a baby, and then you took care of your baby yourself yeah. every day. Yeah. So then you couldn't go to school anymore at that point. I could go to school, but, you know, it was more interesting stuff outside of school to do. Yeah. Like sign up for a week, go to doctor's appointments, you know, do motherly shit. So, and then I, my, you know, I, I was, we was really, we was poor, so I needed to take care of this baby. So I had to go get a job to take care of this baby. As a teenager? As a kid. <laughs> I mean, I just can't even imagine... My kids being in that position, they well, would never either. know what to do. Well, like, and then, and nobody thought, like, we need to get the authorities involved because this guy is an adult. Nobody cares when you poor. And see, that's one thing about what well, society don't realize. They don't care about. Uh, it's not. It's really not a race thing when you poor. You just fucking poor. This could have happened to a little white girl. This could oh, happen yeah. to anybody. But when you when you don't when you don't have the right people around kids or in your life. Nobody cares. And nobody damn sure don't care about a little black girl getting pregnant in the seventh grade. Wow. So you manage to have these two kids. Mm -hmm. how, how? When do you stop having contact with this man so you don't have oh, a third years. with him? Oh, years. I was with him for 10 years. So I, I went you were with him for 10 years. Mm -hmm. Now, how did you make sure you didn't have a third baby by him? I had an abortion. Oh, okay. A few miscarriages and a few abortions. I just knew what it was causing me to take care of these first two kids and how much I was struggling. I was like, I don't want no more kids. I can't, you know, I had an abortion when I was 16 right after my son. And I just said, I I can't afford it. Yeah. And so uh, I divorced my mom. I became emancipated minor. And I was like, I, I can't do this. This is just costing me so much. And, you know, when you go out and fill out an application at 16 years old for a full-time job, and people are like, you're supposed to be in fucking school. So I couldn't really get a job without a work permit. So I became a drug dealer. Oh my! Nobody God. wanted to work permit for that. They just wanted good crack, and good crack is what I had. Now, how did you get to? How did you get involved in that? It uh, 
thank God for Ronald Reagan. He dropped drugs in the black community, as we say. <laughs> oh <my God>. <laughs> <laughs> According Ro to society, the Reagan. So this was like what year? This 80 what? Uh, late 80s. Late wow. 80s. We crack hit the black community about 80. My daughter was born in 86. So by 85, 86, by 88, I was selling dope. And how would you like? How did how does that work? Like, so you you get it from somebody and you buy a little bit. I took my welfare check at the time, which was two hundred and thirty dollars, and I bought my. I think I can't even remember. I think it used to be called a quarter. Uh huh. It was cost like two hundred dollars back in the day, and you would cut it up and, and you would get four hundred dollars worth of crack out of it, and you just keep doubling it, and that's what I did. And then people just knew or like... Yeah, the people just knew who Rabbit was because I had my own little trap. Oh, your name was Rabbit? That's my childhood name, yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, the drug dealers are like rappers. We don't use our government names. Okay. So then like, then people just knew like you'd be at this location at this time. Yeah, all the oh, time. Okay. It was like when you set up a trap, it's like you're a storefront. Okay. And back in those days, people sold drugs with respect. You don't come to my trap. This is my area. So I had my own little area, which was my old neighborhood where I grew up at. And then, but what about the other drug dealers? Did, did they were did they respect you, or did they were they mad that you were doing well, well or I, I was or that you're a woman? Well, I was the most popular drug dealer in the trap, so I didn't have a problem. If you tried to sell, it really didn't affect me because everybody came to look for me. So were you, did, is that when you realized that you were the funniest drug dealer in no, town? No, I wasn't funny then. <laughs> no, no, no. What uh, about just having like a part sparkling personality? Well, like was, if I'm going to buy, you know, it's just like anything. If I'm going to go to a doctor. If I'm going to go, I want to go to the person that, you know, I have some good convo with. Well, you, you can't really make people laugh when they hide because they, okay. they don't even see you. So. All right. <laughs> so I didn't realize I had such a big personality. I was just outspoken. I said whatever the hell I wanted to say. Okay. And if you laugh, you laugh. I wasn't there for entertainment, but I mean, to me, I was a pretty, pretty good damn drug dealer. Comedy came along later. Once I, uh, once um, I went through the welfare to work program, I met a caseworker. This is when first time I voted for Bill Clinton because he was cute. So <laughs> <laughs> I went through that program and I met a caseworker, which the caseworker thought that I was a like she was like. What do you want to go to school for? Because at the time you had to get your GED or you would lose your benefits or you had to go to work. That was it was welfare to work program. So my caseworker is like, you dropped out in eighth grade. Why don't you get a GED? And I was like, oh, for what? And she said, as I went through the GED program, she was like, you really funny. Why don't you try comedy? I said, what the hell is comedy? And she was like, like Richard Pryor. I didn't even know Richard Pryor was a comedian. I thought he was just a funny ass actor. And so I started to do some research at the La Welfare Center. And I was like, this man make this kind of money telling jokes. And I was like, shit. <laughs> I tell shit all the time on the phone talking to my girlfriend. So I went to an open mic. In at, Atlanta. In Atlanta. Uh -huh. A place called The Pub. And I never stopped. So the first time you got up there, did you have even like notes written down or I'm just going to get up and tell a story or what? I had a joke about my brother being a fat cat burglar. And it was this lady in the audience that was drunk who was acting a fool. So I immediately turned my attention to her and just started talking shit to her. And everybody was crying. Like I was so nervous. And I was like, this is it. Oh, I can do this. Guys, I know everybody wants to look their best and you want your hair to look best. But doing my hair, at least, can really be time-consuming. Well, Way wants to give you the confidence to live life your way, especially on wash day. Not sure what type your hair is? Well, you can take a hair quiz to find out and stock up and save on your favorites with 32-ounce shampoo and conditioner refill pouches, which I love. So whether your strands are fine, medium, or thick, Way has shampoo and conditioner that's your type. From volume and shine to deeply hydrating, Way helps you find your way to good hair days every single day. I also love their leave-in conditioner, their hair oil. Peter is obsessed with the hair oil. I also love their hair gloss. It provides immediate shine, it helps treat damage, and enhances color vibrancy. Wash your way to healthier hair with shampoos and conditioners made just for you. Go to the way T H E O-U-A-I.com and use code JUICY for 15% off your entire purchase. That's theway.com, code JUICY.
This episode of Juicy Scoop is brought to you by Booking.com, Booking.Yeah. Guys, it's finally time for summer travel, and I could not be happier. Booking.com offers so many possibilities across the U.S. for all the travelers you want to be, which is perfect for me. I'm doing a lot of traveling, some for work, some for fun, and some a combo. You guys know I have Dallas, Houston, and Austin coming up. I'm bringing Christopher and Jola, and you know I'll be doing it through Booking.com. Whether you're traveling to New York, maybe you're getting that city slicker side going, going to theaters, whatever it is, or you're like me and you just want to enjoy a beach vacation, Booking.com's wide breadth of places to stay across the U.S. make booking whoever you want to be this summer so easy. From hotel suites for one or more romantic villas for a couple's escape, there are so many great choices on Booking.com. What are you waiting for? This summer, you can book whoever you want to be on Booking.com. Booking.yeah. Book today on the site or app. So you do a lot of crowd work still? No. Oh, now you don't. Mm -hmm. I tell a lot of stories. Yeah, me too. I do some crowd work towards the end just to mingle with the audience. But I mostly tell a lot of stories about, you know, how I grew up or being married for 31 years or, you know, having a just Okay, so then when did you get married? 1992. So, so had you started comedy yet or no? Uh, no. Mm -mm. And who did you marry? A nice guy named Garrett. And how did you meet him? Uh, actually, we went to an open mic night at uh, it was Bruce. Bruce was the host. He did. So you were doing? Oh, you were just no, was watching it. You were just we watching. We all went to hang out one night. Oh, but you weren't performing yet. Mm -mm. Okay, mm -mm. I wasn't even on my mind. We just went to go and watch Bruce. Bruce. It was lip singing and comedy together. Okay. So we my. I, my my friend knew my husband brother so we said hey we just all go down here and have a good time together and that's what we did uh-huh and then um so they got married yep got married at the courthouse and uh my kids needed a father so and i ended up getting custody of my sister four kids raised them for 10 years gave wait them that's back. okay so let's talk about that because i remember that being part of some of your sitcoms that you've sold and stuff was mm -hmm. about also taking care of your sister's kids, right? Yes. So how did that come about? So my sister was on crack at the time, and then I was coming out of the world of selling crack because my husband was a, a church guy. And he just the new Garrett was. Yes. He okay. just wasn't. He wasn't raised the way I was. So he was like, well, you know, just go get a job. And I'm like, get a job? Who, who get a job? Why would you get a job with all this money out here? So... <laughs> For love, I traded in the streets. And right after I traded in the streets, my sister was losing her kids. And the defect worker said, somebody don't come get them today. I have to put them in a home. And so my sister had four girls. And I was like, nah. I said, this is family. I don't want that to happen. So we, I went and got them. And for 10 years, I raised them. And so when you took the four kids into your house, with your kids, what were the ages when all six kids were in your house? Uh, well, the two oldest was the same age. I think there was around eight or nine because that's when I met my husband. Okay. My son was probably seven. My sister had a six-month-old. She had a one-year-old. A six-month-old, she had a, about a, a baby about to turn two. And then she probably had a three-year-old. So we had babies, babies. And my husband had no kids at the time. And I now had, he has six. Well, at the time, yeah. at, at the time he had six. Wow. And so, and you never had any more kids yourself? Yes, I had two by my husband. So then you had two with Garrett? Later on, I had two more. Okay, so then when you had the four kids and your sister is not getting better? or No, what? she's not getting better. And at any point, was she calling you and wanting to see the kids or yes. being resentful? Mm -hmm. Or how was your relationship with her being that she was, you know, a drug addict and you're raising her kids? I don't have patience with people. You know, it's no problem with me saying fuck off. Mm -hmm. And for years, her, she she didn't see the kids. But where I went wrong at, I only had temporary custody because I always wanted to give my sister her kids back. Right. When, you know, when she was able and ready. And she found out that I had temporary custody. I never turned it over to permanent custody. And she came and got them. And they all on drugs now. So now, oh. fast forward to 2023, I'm raising one of the kids who I raised. I'm raising her four kids because she's on drugs. And I've had them now for 10 years. Her baby was, oh, I think a month, not even a month old when I got her. Well, this is exactly what you talked about, the curse. Yeah, the generation So that curse. child, so after the 10 years, 
Then they went back to her. My sister's kids. Your sister's kids went mm-hmm. back to her. Mm-hmm. And at that point, they were preteens, teens? They were preteen. They was in high school, good grades and everything. And they all just got on drugs. And, had and how kids. did you feel about them going back to her? Were you, like, relieved or were no, you worried? No, I was very hurt because I, I knew how my mama raised us. And my sister was a lot like my mother. And at first I started to fight it. And then everybody was like, oh, you know, you should give her her kids back. And I was like, y'all know this girl is not capable of of taking care of her kids. You know she, and and I used to tell my brothers, I said, you know, she's going to do the same thing to those kids all mama did to us. And so, you know, I I didn't get any support from the family. So I was like, fuck it. I'm going to go live my life. For my whole life, I've been here trying to save my family. Yeah. So I said, fuck them. And I just walked away and I let her have her kids. So every now and then I would bump into them. Um, uh, my niece, who was a really good track star, ended up immediately getting pregnant. Then uh, the other ones got And if pregnant. she was with you, if she would have stayed with you, she probably... Would have gone on or gone on to play for a you know college or something. I mean, would have well, we, run we or had something. Plans. We had plans. Yeah, you know, she was a senior. We was filling out college applications when our mama came. Oh in. my gosh, what a how heartbreaking! So when she left and she got pregnant, I, you know the struggle was real. I just cut them off because sometimes you know you have to. Sometimes you have to remove toxic situa- situations yeah. out of your life. If not, then you become toxic. So I just said. That's it. You know, fuck them. And that was, let's say I know my niece dropped out of school. My niece got pregnant at 11. 11? 11 or 12. <gasps> and um, I remember because my sister called me and said that the school was mad because she's so fucking dumb. The school was mad because she gave the kids in the six because her daughter was birthday was late and she was held back. And I think she was in the sixth or seventh grade pregnant. And she gave our baby shower invitation. And I was like, are you fucking stupid? This is not a this is not a birthday party. <laughs> so I just continued to remove them out of my life. And then I was in Atlanta one day, and because all of them had kids. One of them went to jail for abusing the kids and just all oh. kind of crazy shit. Make a long story. So it's short. like every time so you're just like doing your own thing and then your phone rings. Yes. And you're like, and they're they're like, can we please speak to? And you're just like, oh shit. Uh, I know this much. is this is something. Well, they was always they would they started to call, and I just I just really removed myself from them. I didn't want to be bothered with anybody. Now at this point, when the sister takes over the kids, are you ha, do you have a career in comedy yet? Uh, comedy is just now kicking off. I'm trying to be a comedian. And but, does the sister know that? Yeah, she knows that. And is she like go girl, or is she like oh you think you're all that? Uh, they didn't think it was serious until okay. it got to this stage now. Okay. You know, they never- So you're not rolling in the money. You're just struggling like everybody else trying to be the good aunt and, you know, mom figure to all these kids. Yeah, no, I didn't. When they was with me, I didn't have, I didn't have nothing. Okay. You know, I'm on welfare. I'm on based on your income housing. I'm working. And I'm just doing things to get by. And then comedy come along. And I find something, and it comes along right after my sister take her kids. So okay. Sometimes you got to be still and let God guide you. I was heartbroken. I mean, I I don't use the word depression because the word depression is too strong. Because when you use that word, it can it, your mind controls the body and how the body feels. So if you speak that, the body will start to feel that. But I was heartbroken because I knew where I was trying to break a generation of Christ. I mean, Christ generation of curse of high school dropout, teenage pregnant molestation, my sister Ugh. just threw her kids back into that pit. So my daughter and my niece was the first two to graduate in three generations. And I just said, I'm going to focus on my own kids. Cause for, so for that part of my life, I had focused on saving family members along with my kids. And then, you know, I was fucking, I was neglecting my own kids. Mm. So I went ahead and I raised my kids. And, and I always had the family that I wanted to have. And I just didn't talk to them. And then fast forward 10 years ago, I'm riding in Atlanta and I get a phone call and my niece tell me she need pampers for her baby and she's pregnant with another baby. She had four kids. She had three outside the stomach and one inside. And I don't even think she was 20. And my other niece who I raised, she's 22. She got seven kids. So, and I asked her where she was at and no lie. 
I was right at the exit where she was at. So I went to this drug infected area and dropped out some pampers and milk. And I just said, Lord, you're not about to trick me into this bullshit again. And I ended up having Christmas dinner with them. And I brought her home with her four kids back to my house. And, and this is only 10 years ago. So now you yeah. are you've been successful for quite a while. Well, yeah. So I get these kids. Yeah. And my career is starting to take off. I go on tour with Cat Williams and stuff. And and make a long story short, I was going to get these kids. To, she run off and leave me with these four kids. So she comes to Christmas. With she moves four- in with me in Indiana. Okay. It's, I'm helping her get off drugs. She, I put in a drug. This is my niece. A drug rehab. Her baby dad is in jail for arm um, robbery. Uh, I'm like, I teach her how to drive. I buy her a car. I help her get an apartment. I help her get a job. She makes supervise. I'm putting in a GED program. Everything to make her life right. And she said, I'm missing something, which is drugs. And she get back on drugs. What and, was her drug? I don't Everything. You name it. She was okay. doing it. She just leave me with these four kids. I tell her, come back and give me full custody. And she said, no. Because, you know, they're my kids. I don't want to give you full custody. I said, Lord, I'm putting them in a fucking foster care. And I tell this bit on stage, and God whispered in my ear and said, keep them, and I got you. My whole career took off. Within that year. I have chills right now. <laughs> within that year. Were you really on stage, and you really felt a voice? I felt a voice. It was a warm voice in my right ear, and it said, keep them. Because I said, I can't do this. I said, I'm trying to have a career. I'm trying to do something right. And I got four fucking kids. And, you know, my daughter was getting ready to go to college. She wanted to go to a HBCU, which is a, a historical black college. Yeah. And, you know, my, we living in Indiana. My daughter done applied to Howard. She done applied to other major. And she got accepted. And so when the, my career is starting to take off. And my, so you my, feel like everything is just like. Finally in place. Yeah. And it's like you're living like a normal person. Yes. Your and kid is now your daughter is about to go to college. And how old was your other child at that my point? My other child was in, uh, he, she, he was, she was 17. So he was 16. He probably in the 10th grade. Okay. So and like so, life is finally getting easier. They're self sufficient. You're not raising any babies. Well, and no, then I got think, my nieces there with the No, four no, kids. but I'm saying like, mm-hmm. so that you're like, okay. And then you hear that, no, keep them. So then what happened? And so when I, when I, when I said, well, we can't put him in the foster home. We'd have had this baby for six months. You love this fucking baby. Right, of course. You know, she didn't ask to be here. We saw this baby come off drugs. We saw this baby do... Now, how old are the niece's kids that you're... um, At the time, it was a six-month-old baby, a a two-year-old girl, uh, and a boy and a girl that was six, mm. five or six. So I said... uh, It was a girl five and a boy six. So I said, you know... All little, yeah. All little. I left them at my house, so I said, you know what? I'm going to keep them, but I don't know how. So since I'm a convicted felon, make a long story short, the state of Indiana said you don't qualify for anything. Because you got caught for selling drugs? Yeah, because I'm I'm a, I'm a uh, ex-drug dealer. Okay. I'm a convicted felon. So they said, well, if you took my niece's kid, they'd have gave you $750 or $900 per child. Since it was me and I was a family member, they only gave me two hundred, I mean $310 for four kids. No a food month. Stamp, a month. No food stamps. No child care nothing nothing i couldn't get anything this episode of juicy scoop is sponsored by away you guys have seen their fabulous suitcases for years in the airport well this away product launch was born out of insight that some people are just soft side i mean soft suitcases soft shell etc type people and they prefer to use a soft versus a hard suitcase. Well, this one is awesome. Softside comes in four of their best-selling sizes and tried in true colors. So there's something for everyone in the lineup. Two carry-on sizes, two check sizes. The colors are black, blue, pink, and gray. They are made from high-strength nylon, so the bag is tear-resistant as well as weather-resistant. The bag is soft but not sensitive. It's super durable, flexible, and expandable. So you buy a couple extra things on your trip, you can expand it. No souvenir left behind. I'm telling you, this is my kind of bag because guess what? I buy stuff every time I am away, whether I'm doing stand-up or you know having a fun time. And then I'm like, oh, how am I going to get this in? Well, now I can because I've got this new away bag. You've got to check out the new soft side luggage from away. Head over to awaytravel.com slash juicy scoop. That's awaytravel.com slash juicy scoop to see the new soft side luggage from away. Awaytravel.com slash juicy scoop. What if you could take a weekly shot and lose weight and keep it off? I've spent tons of money on the juice cleanses, soup diets, keto, 
hours of cardio. The $20 smoothies, are you kidding? That are probably just filled with sugar anyway? No, it didn't work. Well, now I found something that does. Row Body Program provides access to the most popular weight loss shots on the market. The Row Body Program pairs a weekly shot with healthy, lifestyle changes so you can lose your weight and actually keep it off. I love that this is so convenient. You can sign up online in the comfort of your own home, which means no scheduling a doctor's appointment, no commute to a doctor's office, no waiting rooms, the whole thing so easy. Average weight loss is 15 to 20 percent in one year with healthy lifestyle changes BMI and other eligibility criteria apply. Go to road.co slash juicy scoop. Sign up today and you'll pay just $99 for your first month and $145 a month after that. Medication costs are separate. That's ro.co slash juicy scoop. So to get food step, I had to put my whole household on that. Well, my husband worked at General Motors. I wasn't going to do that. I, I worked my ass to get out the system. I wasn't going back for these kids. So I said, fuck it. So make a long story short. Um, Don't make it short. This well, is so interesting. <laughs> well, and sad, I, but it, but no. inspiring too. Like I want to know. Like I I appreciate you telling no 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 how well. you you know would change your mind and know that you're you know doing the right thing is well, going to reward you. You have to believe that you know everything happens for a reason. Why God took those four kids and placed them in my life. I realize it now, but at the beginning, I was pissed off. So, you know, I, I don't have permanent custody. Nobody's trying to give me permanent custody. So my mind said, well, go apply for temporary custody, right? Because she didn't leave. She just left the kids, and they came to the house and said, well, you got food in the refrigerator. You can take care of the kids. Well, no, I can't if I don't, got, I don't have no way of talking and speaking for these kids. So I go. I literally, I go to the courthouse and get temporary custody. I go in front of a judge. He hit the mic and said, I am a fan. Because I did a popular show, Bob and Tom. You know Bob and yeah, Tom yeah. in the young. And he said, well, do you want permanent custody? And I said, yes. And that day I got permanent custody. And people was like, how the fuck did you get permanent custody? I said, God placed me in front of the right judge who understood my situation. Totally. And who who wanted these kids to have a future. So now the kid, the youngest is 10 years old and won't shut the hell up, but I love her to death. Okay. And the old, I have two ninth graders and I have a seventh grader. And they're thriving. They're great. That is awesome. Now, where is the mother? Selling pussy in the West End of Atlanta somewhere. I don't know. <laughs> but she doesn't reach out. Well, um, What no, about, like, in the day of social media? Like, she doesn't... I don't put them on social media. They don't have a phone. I know, but she doesn't try to, like, DM you or no. find you or... Mm -hmm. She's she, nowhere, man. She's, do, she's not trying to... Well, I'm a no-nonsense person. I don't play no games. I'm 51 years old, Heather. I don't have time for this shit. You're not going to come in with your crackhead stories and try to play with my emotions. Leave them alone. Just leave them alone. You saw what happened when your mama stepped back in your life. So let's break this cycle and leave these kids alone. Let them grow up. If they decide to come back and let you be their mama, then you can be their mama. They know who their mama is. They call me auntie. They only yeah. call me mama when they want something. Or they introduce me as their parents. So, you know, nobody got to really know um, our business, but right? They know I'm they they, they grand aunt or whatever the hell I am. I'm they I don't know what aunt I am to them. Yeah, I but guess I'm it'd aunt. be a grand aunt. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. But I, I don't try to. I don't. We don't discuss their mother. We don't discuss their father. All I'm here to do is love you and give you the foundation to start off of a solid foundation to start off of something that I never had. Now, what happened with Garrett? What, I'm still married. Oh, I thought you said I was married for 31 years. No, I'm so married 31 oh, years. Oh, you're still? Oh, good. I'm glad. I, I, the whole time I was getting waiting for the sad part of when oh, Garrett, no. after everything he's done. No, I wouldn't trade him in for the world. Oh, good, good. No, I'm yeah. still married. Okay, no. great. Okay, so then you start doing stand-up, and I feel like... How long? I feel like you've been popping for like what, like fifteen years? That we're oh. like, we're like, what was your first series? I remember reading that you had a series. Maybe it was just a pilot, but I remember reading like what your pilot was about, about how taking in the four kids and all yeah. this stuff. And I was like, wow, this is really. I'm excited. This is interesting. Um, yeah. So I did. I did Joe Rogan. And I did Mark Marin, and I'm not lying. When I tell you they released those podcasts within the same week, Hollywood came knocking. And they was like, We want this is a TV show. And I met like six or seven studios. And I ended what up. What year is this now around? 
Mm, I don't remember. Five years ago. Well, Only five? Well, it must nine have been years ago. Because I, I, nine years no, ago. No, I think it, it's it, more longer than that. Yeah, I think it's more like 10 or something. Yeah, it's like yeah. 10 now because yeah. it took five years to get on TV and I'm going into the fourth season of it. Oh, okay. So um, I went through a couple couple production companies and, you know, my, my Fox, I landed at Fox, which was good, everybody thought. Yeah. And then went through two writers and, and it was Lee Daniel and Ron Howard project and so you know Hollywood you don't get three chances to develop no sitcom they no. throw your ass out the door but for some reason I got three chances and so it had to be Gus saying hold on I got this person for you but that, I haven't developed them right so all while I go through these two writers it's a young kid named Jordan E. Cooper sitting somewhere in his last year of high school getting ready to go to college and he's going to his college for fine art here in New York and he ended up getting on the same agency that Lee Daniel was with and when they threw the show out the second time Lee asked Fox give her one more chance we got something here make a long story short this he said I got this kid I'm gonna go to the street I found this kid Jordan e. Cooper and this kid studied me so hard I mean, and he's he, only like a, a freshman in he's college. Only like 21, oh, okay. 21, but 22. In no, college, no, no, or he just sorry. finished. No, he he was in college just last year. Wow, he, he already graduated. So Lee was and like, he's just a writer. Drop out. Okay, just drop out. You, I said, boy, don't drop out. Finish your college degree. You don't wait this many years. So in his last year of college. We're writing. We, we're trying to develop the show. We take it over to Fox, and Fox is like. So he studied. He watched all your stand-up specials, he to us, everything. Okay, yeah. But Fox said this boy ain't never developed nothing. How are we gonna let him come in and develop a show? This is Fox. He's twenty-one, twenty-two. No. So as we're looking, as Ron, as Ron Howard Company and Fox is looking for another our third writer, I tell the kid, I say, look, boy, they're never gonna hire you. They're lying to you. Let's write a pilot. And if it don't work, I just say I wrote the pilot. So we up for a week straight putting this thing together. Cause he he kind of had it in his head, and I just gave him, you know, I gave him the, I gave him the vehicle. He had he was already had the drivers. He had to he had I had already had the show cast. To be honest with you, we get it together. We writing this pilot. We going back and forth. We eight days in. I said, Lee Daniel, I want you to read something. And he's like, uh, What do you want me to read? And he's like, yeah, You need to get, stop trying to write stuff, we already getting you writers. But as I'm talking to these production companies, which is Ron Howard Company, they was like, we got four more writers for you to meet. I'm like, write, motherfucker, write. Write, hurry up and write. <laughs> so I take And leave. he's like in college still like going to classes. Yes, and going then to writing classes, the sitcom. All That's night. amazing. We're writing the sitcom. That's amazing. I handed it over to Lee Daniel. He read it. He called me back. He said, who the fuck wrote this? And I said, me. And he said, no, you didn't. Everything is spelled right. <laughs> And so <laughs> I tell him the kid that he brought to me wrote this and he couldn't, Fox and couldn't believe it. They was like, okay, he can write the pilot. So we, 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 we had pretty much wrote the pilot. Wow. And not only did we write the pilot, we had the whole first season planned out had they picked it up. And so you shot it? We, no, we actually, filmed it or what actually, happened? we, we, they switched the character. They allowed me to be me more. Okay. So with that, my sitcom is the first to do that type of like cussing, really pushing the envelope, I believe. Yeah. So they was like, well, we can't show this on network. And so the, the co creator is like, well, let's take it to a streaming service. Hulu bought it. And <laughs> Hulu buys it and say, hell no. <laughs> <laughs> this too, this is too edgy now. No, well, or I just don't think. I think some people at Hulu wanted it, but their decision making didn't understand what it to, what it was like to be a black mom in America. They didn't think people like me existed because they never interact with a Miss Pat before. But it's a whole audience out there for that type of mom. You know, blunt, honest, set your black ass down. Don't me, don't make me slap your white. You know, I say yeah. all kind of shit on my show. So. I just think that they didn't think it was a market or or an audience for that. And then they let it loose. Be, they dropped it. i never forget how the, I was going on stage, sold out in Raleigh, North Carolina. I get a phone call, Lee Day. You can hear the crackling in his voice. He said, Hulu didn't pick you up. And I said, okay, that's fine. I said, but I'm sold out. I got to go. He said, are you okay? I said, I'm fine. Not one time in my heart did I not believe that they would pick up that show. Somebody. Two months goes by, 
BET Plus would like to do your show. And I said, what the hell is BET Plus? And so my co-creator was, he knew everything about TV. You know, if it's a streaming service that was new, he knew about it. And he's like, oh my God, he got less than a million followers. We're going to die over there. And I said, one thing I know about life from selling crack all the years that I sold it, if your product is good, the people will come no matter where the fuck you at. Let me tell you something. You got some crackhead that will climb to the moon to get what they want. And I'm just being honest. And so we we created this show, went over to BET. They released it. Bam. It shut the app down. Because so many people were so subscribing people and watching. That is so awesome. Yes. And so now that show is... is my sitcom. Is a sitcom. Based off of my life. And you filmed that in Atlanta? Or? I filmed that in Atlanta. Awesome. So that's close. So it's like you can just go out of your door and go to the studio and... Do you do it in front of a live audience we or do a single it in front camera? Of a live audience, which uh, a lot of people got away with, away yeah. from. But no, baby, we have a party. When I yeah. tell you, people are lined up to come see Miss Pat show tape live, and I think we're the only one that's doing it in Atlanta. Right. So we we taped the pilot in L.A. and we just took everything that we learned from L.A. over to Atlanta, which was a little hard in the beginning because they don't shoot live shows and people are not used to coming to see live sitcom shot like that. Yeah. But it worked. I mean, the third season was popping. We was turning people away. Amazing. And now you have another show. Yes, I'm a judge. And so tell us about that because I love this. So it's called Miss Pat Settles It. So after the Miss Pat show was pretty successful, um, my agents and thing, we started to talk with Viacom and BET. And I ended up getting the overall deal over there. And because I just, I like being at Viacom because they understand who I am. Mm -hmm. And they allow me to create in my voice. They don't try to strip me of my voice. So I signed a two-year deal over at Viacom. And my 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 deal was to bring them more shows. So I brought them the court show. And I said, hey, I got an idea, but I think it should be somebody else. And they was like, no, nah, what about you? And I said, what you mean, what about me? I'm a convicted felon. They was like, I said, I can't be a judge. I've been to jail. They was like, oh, it's TV. You can be Jesus. So <laughs> I, I taped it, and I was like, oh, I like this. So and people come in with, like, a people's court. Is like there a, a real case? Court. Yeah, and then you kind of think, feel. So, like, what are some of the cases? Tell me one case that you got to decide who should get what. Well, this one black lady went to her friend. She wanted a fair faucet haircut. Farrah and, Fawcett, okay. You know, everybody want to look like Farrah Fawcett. And I don't want to know why these two plus-size women thought they could look like Farrah Fawcett, but she cut the wig <laughs> up like Joe Dirt. <laughs> oh, she brought the wig to be to be, be styled. To be styled and okay. color like Farrah Fawcett. Okay. And when I tell you, she chopped that bitch up like it had been through a blender. <laughs> <laughs> So it's, it's it, and what was crazy because I didn't know it was real cases and real people. So when I said, "Oh, I'm gonna give you five thousand dollars, but I'm gonna give you extra two thousand dollars because you cried," and they was like, "You you messing up the budget." I said, "What are you talking about?" They said, "Miss Pat, this <laughs> real money." I said, "This shit real?" <laughs> you didn't even know that till no. you were actually filming. So I was actually filming, just giving out money. Oh my god, that's hilarious! Yeah. I I love that. Um. Okay, so I want to ask you a little bit, since you're in Atlanta, I am a big Housewife fan. Have you had any dealings with the real Housewives of Atlanta? Do you know any of them? Have I, you ever, <laughs> like, popped in for a scene or anything? I just uh, did some promo with NeNe. Love her. Uh, yes, I do, too. And uh, Candy's, I see Candy all the time. Candy's the best. Yes, but uh, who is, I don't really, I bump into them at parties and stuff, but I've never really watched the Housewives. Oh, uh, Okay. So I'm yeah. not I'm not a reality type TV right, yeah. person. I'm my background. Well, I mean, those are the two, Candy and Nene, like they are like, well, Nene, you know, pursued acting and everything before and then since she's acted. So she's in the professional realm. And then of course Candy is too. So like you know, the other ladies are just, you know, really housewives, you know, that, that got on the show. So yeah. yeah. So, I mean, so I bump in, I see everybody at, you know, nights nice or out, you know, whatever. I'm right. in that little circle now. So if I go to an event, you probably see most of them. Yeah, I love it. And now I want to ask you, what do you think? Now, I am going to buy Jada's book today. I'm going okay. to the bookstore because I want to read it myself. And I also want to listen to the audio. 
because I'm hearing all the clips about Jada and Will, and you're probably seeing all the clips, too, of the things that she has said. And so I just want to give, get your opinion of them in general. What do you think is going on? Uh, I don't know what's going on. I tell people all the time, mind your damn business. If you mind your damn business, I got other stuff going on. My husband got diabetes. He passed gas at night. He snore really loud. I don't give a damn about no Jada and Will. Yeah. I mean, I, I'm hoping she's doing all of this to make this book a bestseller. No, she, she I think she is. And I mean, she, hey, I'm buying the book too. Let me tell you, yeah. so I'm buying the book and I don't even read no damn book. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, de I'm, I'm definitely reading the book. Um, no, I mean it's just she's dropping, you know, a lot of things that are that seemed nobody a little controversial. cares about. She was up here talking about uh, what you call got alopecia. The man been dead for over twenty years. Tupac, he, she he said Tupac had head. alopecia too. Yeah, he ain't even got a head no more. <laughs> you know what she also said? I forgot to say this because I talked about this on my show. Do you know that like Willow, the daughter of she and Will? Wrote some letter to Tupac, Tupac, to, to Tupac, and saying, "Please come back down from heaven so my mommy can be happy." And Will was aware of it. Well, that is like I just feel bad for Will. So Heather, it's, and it's, then other people say I shouldn't feel bad well, for Will. Well, Heather, it's obvious you never had any good black dick before. <laughs> <laughs> it, you are one hundred percent correct. When you get good black, I haven't dick, had any. <laughs> well, when you get some good black dick, you will be writing Jesus too to bring them good black dicks back. Okay. <laughs> 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 so, obvious Willow knew what Tupac had put on her, her mama, and she wanted to see her mama grin. And I tell people all the time, there's a difference between thug dick and educated dick. They don't run in the same circle. What's the difference of the circles? One I'm pound you, one I'm hunt you. <laughs> Wait, one will what? One pound you. Oh, one pound. Okay. And the other one goes gentle and slow. Wait, so which one is which? The one, the ghetto dick. The I ghetto is the pounder, or the ghetto yeah, is the the okay. ghetto is the pounder. Oh, oh, that's good sex. When a guy oh, got a okay. tattoo, they 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 can't read. They thugged out. They can fuck. <laughs> 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 what about women who um, fall in love with the guy behind the bars? I'm fascinated by that. They have a whole. They're that's who they're seeking out. They visit them. They didn't know them even before they got in. What? What do you think of women like that? Women that do, they like having a boyfriend who's in prison. They feel they're going to save him. They go visit I him. I think them bitches are crazy. I mean, but they, you got to say, hey, they've been, they, 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 you and the thugs have got some good sex, uh, Heather. They do. But I don't know. It's according to how long he's been in jail yeah. for me. Because, you know, you don't want anybody to come down and, and just want to switch it back out because they, they're on the other side. You know, some people... Some people like men that go both ways. I like my man to go one way. So, oh, you mean some that are bisexual? Yes, bisexual. Yes, I always remember that one of my favorite Oprahs was the Down Low episode. Do you remember that one? <laughs> no. You don't know, remember the episode? I live in Atlanta. This was like so eye opening. So Oprah had on all these black guys mm -hmm. who then were like, "We're on the Down Low." That was the first time I ever heard the Down Low. And Heather. Yes, on Oprah. This, but this is like 20 years ago. This is a long time okay. ago. The height of Oprah, like, you know. And they um, they were like, look, we have wives, girlfriends, but we just like some, we like having sex with men, mm -hmm. but we don't want to be in a parade. We don't want to live a gay lifestyle. We're just on the down low. And I just wrote, and I'm hearing these women's stories about how they never knew. And then they came home one day and what fucking. they're seeing. And I'm like, and I guess it was because for this age of men, which now these guys would be, you know, 56 years old, it was just so unaccepted to be gay, to, to be to, gay. No, only to, only, see, no, it's only, it was only to be unaccepted to be gay to people who wasn't gay. If people were minding their fucking business, it would have never been unacceptable. Right, right. I never gave a fuck about nobody being gay. Yeah. I gave a fuck about my own vagina. I can only keep up with my vagina. I can barely keep up with When the <laughs> hair get to growing, it look like the gap band down there. So I can't be worried about nobody else. That's the exactly. problem of society. We too, we too busy worrying about anybody. All you got to do is be happy. Right. If, you were, if you're happy, you can't notice what other people is doing. You're only noticing shit because you're miserable. Yes, and you exactly. and you and the stuff that you're noticing is somebody else's happiness. That's why you got an opinion.
And that's what's wrong with the world. Jada and Pitt, Jada and well, Will been switching out each other for years. Yeah. Why is everybody shocked? Well, she said they're not. She said all those rumors about them being swingers and gay and um, open marriage, whatever, was they, not true until seven years ago when they said they when they said we're separated. Then she got with her f- son's friend. Yeah, and then and I can uh, understand why. Did you not see his penis? August. It was huge. How did you see August's penis? And some draws on Instagram, right? <laughs> <laughs> Is there a photo of him like walking across the street and you see it? Uh, no, it ain't that kind of dick, Heather. <laughs> oh. <laughs> fuck you think we got black men got cow dicks <laughs> no white and there's times when you get a guy whether it's john ham who's white or anybody of any ethnicity mm. and they're wearing a certain kind of pants yes, and you can you really see thing. it yes through yes. the clothes did you see it naked or through the clothes i think i saw it through the clothes okay and it looked yeah. big uh yeah and it wasn't even hard i mean but you you a middle-aged woman right yeah uh, come on will smith is 52 55 maybe he ain't doing what olga agostino doing whatever his name he ain't <laughs> doing what he doing okay so yeah. let's just keep it real i can understand why she jumped on that bike it had both wheels a 55 year old man got a flat somewhere <laughs> I love your analogies and expressions. Yeah, that is really what like makes your comedy, I think, so yeah. funny and unique. I mean, some uh, you married sometimes to keep the, the 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 spice. You gotta you gotta reminisce. Ooh, Lord, I remember when nineteen ninety two. Then you start imagining that person. Yeah, you know, and he's a, and all of a sudden you hollering. He's like, "Why are you hollering? You like you looking like oh, it's you." That never happened to you? Don't say it. Well, I've been married 23 years. Yes. Okay. Well, we go yeah, I've been going. married 23 years, but, you know, listen, I'm watching The Golden Bachelor. I don't want to be on it. So now I'm like, I'm happy. But yes. I'm happy, you know, but there's times when your friends are getting divorced and they're getting some fresh dick and you're hearing the stories at the <laughs> dinner and you're then you come home to the man in the lazy chair or whatever and you're like but in the end you know as long as you have a good man that's what's so important but yeah. that's just all the truth of it you know i truly understand why middle-aged women's are out dating older men i mean young younger men. yeah i can i can't do it because yeah. they 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 lazy they eat i have a 37 year old son i could never see me dating a 37 year old that's just not my thing yes plus they got too much energy for me I just want to lay down and look at TikTok. I don't want you rubbing on me. You know, yeah. you got to fix yourself up for him. You got to put on a good bra. You, it's hard to tell a 37-year-old why your titties are uneven. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to keep what I got because I don't have to explain stuff. My husband know how to untouch my navel, I mean my nipple from my navel. <laughs> a 37-year-old would know, why is that connected, boy? Pull it apart, okay? So I'm going to keep what I got. Too much instruction. Too much instruction. We're done, yeah. Oh, my gosh, so funny. Um, thank you so much for coming on. Now, you have a big tour with lots of dates. Yes, I do. It's called my first theater tour. Call Your Girl Done Made It. Oh, my God. That's what it's called? Oh, Your Girl Done Oh, I love it. Yes. Oh, my gosh. So you're going everywhere. Minneapolis this weekend. Mm-hmm. Dallas, Washington, D.C. Oh, you said you're at the Howard Theater, did you say? Uh-huh, I have two I, shows at the Howard. I performed there. It's beautiful. I heard it was beautiful. It's beautiful. Um, that's in Washington, D.C. You're going to Philly, San Antonio, Houston, Atlanta, of Chicago. Chicago is my favorite place to perform. Uh, Cleveland, Mad. Oh, look at all these new dates. Cleveland, Madison, San Francisco, Portland. Oh, fabulous. All you got to do is go to misspackcomedy.com. Do, do you remember where you are in San Francisco? I just came from there. Mm-mm. You know where I'm at in San Francisco? So tell everybody where they can buy the tickets and watch all the shows and uh, follow Miss, you. MissPatComedy.com for your Girl Done Made It tour. But please tune in uh, October the 18th. BET at 10 p.m. I will be their first judge. Yes. How Miss Pat settles it. Yes, you look so pretty there, too. Thank you. Thank you. I'm so glad you came. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Guys, don't forget to go to heathermcdonald.net. I'm coming to San Diego July 27th with Julie Goldman. Then I'm in Dallas and Saratoga and Houston and Austin. All of that is in August with Chris Frangioli, your favorite. So go to heathermcdonald.net, get those tickets, get ready to laugh. It's the Juicy Scoop experience. Yes. I know it can be really frustrating to try to find a shampoo and conditioner combo that really caters to your hair type. 
Well, Way wants to give you the confidence to live life your way, especially on wash day. So whether your strands are fine, medium, or thick, Way has shampoo and conditioner. That's your type. Not sure what type your hair is? Well, you can take a hair quiz to find out. Wash your way to healthier hair with shampoos and conditioners made just for you. Go to the way, T H E. O-U-A-I dot com and use code JUICY for 15% off your entire purchase. That's theway.com code JUICY.